2023-2024 National Federation of High Schools Rules Changes and Points of Emphasis. This presentation is brought to you by the International Association of Approved Basketball Officials. IBO is a nonprofit service and professional organization managed by and for basketball officials. Since 1921, IBO has been the worldwide leader in recruiting and training basketball officials and has grown to a network spanning 38 U.S. states and 11 foreign countries with over 14,000 members. IBO's stated purposes are to educate, train, develop, and provide continuous instruction for basketball officials, to promote the welfare of the game of basketball to players, coaches, administrators, and officials, to have an adequate number of thoroughly trained and capable officials available at all times, to maintain the highest standard of basketball officiating, to encourage the spirit of fair play and sportsmanship. 2023-24 National Federation of High Schools Rules Changes Shot Clock Operator for those states using a shot clock, this rules change requires the shot clock operator to sit at the scores and timers table. This establishes the placement of the shot clock operator to address the growing use of video boards that allow tablet control from anywhere in the gym. Uniform bottoms. Beginning this season, the terms shorts, skirts will change to uniform bottoms. This rules change requires uniform bottoms to be light-colored while allowing different styles among teammates. This creates specific guidelines for uniform bottoms that were previously undefined. In this image, if team members were attired using all the various uniform bottoms as shown, the team members would be considered properly equipped. Undershirts. This change allows undershirts worn under dark team jerseys to be solid black or a single solid color similar to the torso of the jersey. All team members wearing undershirts must wear the same solid color. This allows players from schools with a unique jersey color to have an undershirt option when wearing their dark team jersey. Players stepping out of bounds. This rules change establishes that a player may step out of bounds without penalty unless they are the first player to touch the ball after returning to the court or if they left the court to avoid a violation. This penalizes a team only if a player leaves the court on their own volition and is the first to touch the ball after returning to the court or has left the court to avoid a violation. In this play, Red, number 23, steps off the court of his own volition, runs along the end line, then re-enters the court and is the first to touch the ball after returning to the court. Beginning with the 2023-24 season, a player stepping off the court of their own volition is no longer an infraction unless they are the first to touch the ball as demonstrated on this play. In this next play, white number 14 steps off the court under his own volition, but is not the first to touch the ball upon his return to the court. In this situation, it is legal for white 14 to catch the ball. It should be noted that this rules change does not only pertain to the players on the team with the ball, if a defender is the first to touch the ball, the player returning to the court may then legally touch the ball. When an official observes a player stepping off the court under their own volition, the covering official should display the withheld whistle delayed violation signal to communicate a potential infraction has occurred. This violation will most often be observed by the lead official. However, the center or trail officials in a crew of three or the trail official in a crew of two 
may assist with this ruling as needed. While it is legal for players to step off the court on their own volition, they cannot do so to avoid a violation. In this image, the player in the white jersey steps off the court to avoid a three-second violation. In this situation, a player stepping out of bounds has committed a violation and the official should penalize the infraction. This rules change does not apply to players who are legally out of bounds due to momentum. For example, after attempting a layup or saving a ball near a boundary line. In these scenarios, it is legal for a player to be the first to touch the ball as long as they have established inbound status when they contact the ball. Bonus free throw situations. The rule change has eliminated all one and one free throw situations. The rules change establishes the bonus as two free throws awarded for a common foul, beginning with the team's fifth foul in each quarter. However, the number of team fouls are reset to zero at the end of each quarter. An overtime period is considered an extension of the fourth quarter. Therefore, when the overtime period occurs, the team foul counts will not be reset to zero for the overtime period. This rules change is intended to improve the flow of the game and reduce opportunities for rough play during rebound action that used to occur during one-on-one -on -one free throw situations. Throw-in spots. Throw-in spots for all out-of-bounds violations in both the front court and the back court will remain at the spot nearest to where the ball went out of bounds. When a team is gaining or retaining possession of the ball in their backcourt, the throw-in will be at the spot nearest to where the violation, foul, held ball, or other stoppage occurred. This year's rules change establishes four designated front court throw-in spots. Two spots are located along the sideline, 28 feet from the end line, and two spots are located three feet outside each lane along the end line. When a team is gaining or retaining possession for a front court throw in for any reason other than out of bounds violation, the throw in will be at one of the four designated spots nearest to where the stoppage occurred. This will help ensure the accuracy of where the ball will be awarded and allows coaches more defined locations to employ offensive and defensive strategies for throw ins. One of those strategies will be where the ball is located when a timeout is granted when a player has control of the ball on the court. When a player is located within the imaginary trapezoid when a timeout is granted, the ensuing throw-in spot would be on the end line three feet outside the nearest lane line. If the player is located outside the imaginary trapezoid when a timeout is granted, the ensuing throw-in spot would be at the 28-foot mark along the sideline nearest to where the ball was located when the timeout was granted. Coaches and players will need to pay particular attention to ball location as it relates to the imaginary trapezoid when requesting timeouts. Understanding this rule change will have a significant impact on offensive and defensive strategies. However, it should be noted that this provision does not pertain for timeouts granted after an out-of-bounds violation has occurred. If a front court throw-in is a result of an out-of-bounds violation, the throw-in spot does not move to one of the four designated front court throw-in spots if a timeout is granted before the completion of the throw-in. After the conclusion of the timeout, the ensuing throw-in must be from the original designated spot where the ball went out of bounds. However, this rules change does pertain to throw-in violations. When a throw-in violation occurs, the new throw-in is from the same designated spot as the original throw-in spot, unless the team gaining control of the ball will be in their front court. If that is the case, the throw-in will be from the nearest of the four designated front court throw-in spots. However, 
It should be noted that a boundary plane warning will not cause the throw-in spot to move to one of the four front court designated spots. In these instances, the ensuing throw-in remains at the original throw-in spot. Finally, as it has been in previous years, when a team is awarded the ball for a throw-in as a result of a timeout, held ball, double foul, inadvertent whistle, or injury situation, the throw-in spot will be based on the location of the ball when the stoppage occurred. When a team is awarded the ball for a throw-in as a result of a common foul or violation, the throw-in spot will be based on where the infraction occurred. In review, just remember, if a team is gaining or retaining the ball for a throw-in as a result from an out-of-bounds violation or any stoppage in the backcourt, the throw-in will be from the nearest spot. If a team is gaining or retaining the ball in the front court for any reason other than an out-of-bounds violation, the throw-in will be at one of the four front court designated throw-in spots. Awarding the ball to the wrong team for a throw-in. This rules change allows officials to correct the mistake before the first dead ball and after the ball becomes live unless there is a change of possession. This change allows a more reasonable time frame for the officials to correct their mistake. In this image, the ball was incorrectly awarded to the team in white jerseys in the backcourt for a throw-in with 2.05 remaining in the third quarter. The mistake was discovered with 2.01 remaining in the quarter. The officials will correct the mistake by awarding the ball to the correct team that was entitled to the ball. If the throw-in team is gaining control of the ball in their front court, the throw-in will be from one of the four front court designated throw-in spots. In this example, it would be at the 28-foot mark along the sideline. However, if the original spot was due to an out-of-bounds violation, the ball would be awarded at the original throw-in spot that resulted from the out-of-bounds violation. Consumed time may be placed back on the clock if the officials have definite knowledge of the time consumed or know the exact time on the clock when the throw-in took place. This could be as a result of direct knowledge of the time on the clock when the throw-in was administered or due to officials counting in the backcourt or in closely guarded situations. In this next scenario, the ball was incorrectly awarded to a team in white jerseys for a throw-in in their front court with 2.05 remaining in the third quarter. The mistake was discovered with 2.01 remaining in the quarter. Since the team in the red jerseys will be gaining possession of the ball in their backcourt, the ball will be awarded at the original throw-in spot. Once again, Consumed time may be placed back on the clock if the officials have definite knowledge of the time consumed or the exact time the throw-in took place. This rules change should serve as a reminder to officials that after putting the ball in play, officials should check to see that the clock was properly started. After each whistle, officials should check to see that the clock was properly stopped. 2023-24 National Federation of High Schools Points of Emphasis Uniforms, Equipment, and Apparel Uniforms remain an important aspect of the educational experience for the student-athlete. School sports uniforms play a vital role in promoting student identity and unity, instilling a sense of belonging and purpose. There's a certain amount of pride that comes with wearing a uniform and representing not just the individual, but the entire team, their school, their family, and their community. Every coach, every team member, and all other bench personnel should take pride in their appearance and honor the expectations set at their schools and community. It is imperative that coaches, players, and officials understand the uniform, equipment, and apparel rules. Recent rules changes have accommodated emerging styles and cultural developments 
to aid with compliance by team members. This in turn has taken some of the pressure off officials to be the uniform police before the game begins. This year is no exception as the rules committee is allowing the use of black undershirts under the dark jerseys. This should give schools another option to be legally equipped as some schools have struggled to find undershirts that are similar to the dominant color of the jersey. The head coach is directly responsible for legality of the uniforms and making sure their team members are properly equipped. The head coach should set the expectations for their team to be properly equipped before the season and ensure compliance throughout the season. The head coach should not put the onus on officials to have to enforce the uniform, equipment, and apparel rules. During the pregame coaches and captains meeting, each head coach is required to inform officials that their team is properly equipped and will remain that way during the contest. This meeting is intended to set the tone for the contest and establish expectations for team members to comply with the rules. During pregame warm-ups, officials should prohibit further participation if there is a safety concern. If any illegal apparel or equipment is observed, the team members can continue to warm up but will not be able to participate in the game unless the situation is resolved. If officials observe an issue with illegal uniforms, equipment, or apparel, the issue should be addressed directly with the head coach and not the players. Schools may make requests to make an exception to uniform rules for special events. These requests must be submitted to the State Association for approval before the event and may not be altered by mutual agreement between schools or coaches. If you are interested in receiving a great resource for understanding these rules, the IBO Uniform Equipment and Apparel document is available free of charge. This two-page document outlines these rules in a visual format for easy reference. There are two ways to receive a copy. For IBO members, go to the Members Only area at www.ibo.org and it can be downloaded from the site. For non-IBO members, please contact IBO at info at ibo.org to request the document. Bench Decorum the Rules Committee is concerned about bench decorum rule violations. Head coaches are expected to remain in the coaching box. The rules change that allowed the extension of the coaching box to 28 feet was intended to allow head coaches to communicate with their players without violating the coaching box rule. Coaches who go beyond the coaching box or onto the court gain a distinct advantage which is not within the spirit and intent of the rules. In this image, the head coach of the team in the red jerseys steps onto the court to communicate with her players. This is a violation of the coaching box rule. For the first violation of the coaching box, the official shall warn the head coach unless the offense is judged to be major, in which case a technical foul shall be assessed. Head coaches, assistant coaches, team members, and other bench personnel are not allowed to disrespectfully or inappropriately address and or gesture at an official after a ruling is made on the court. Players and coaches are permitted to celebrate an individual or team accomplishment, but they cannot direct that celebration toward their opponent. Taunting, baiting, finger pointing, trash talking, and using inappropriate gestures have increased during the past several seasons. Specifically, trendy hand gestures and body language meant to demean and single out opponents do not reflect good sporting behavior and have no place in the interscholastic setting. Coaches are reminded 
that while the bench area expands during a timeout, the bench area does not extend beyond the 28-foot line. Coaches and other bench personnel may not move to the expanded bench area until the timeout begins to ensure bench personnel do not create inadvertent contact with opposing players still out on the playing court. Coaches who leave the expanded bench area to engage officials inappropriately are subject to a warning or a bench technical foul. Officials are expected to enforce the bench decorum rules. Officials are encouraged to use all the tools at their disposal to ensure compliance. These tools include issuing an administrative warning for misconduct to coaches or bench personnel and assessing a technical foul if warranted. If a head coach or other bench personnel exhibit unsportsmanlike behavior, the official must issue a warning unless the offense is deemed to be major. If the offense is considered major, no warning should be given. A direct technical foul should be charged to the head coach or bench personnel. The warning for behavior given to the head coach or bench personnel is an administrative action that is documented in the scorebook and then the head coach is informed. A second unsporting act committed by any member of bench personnel, including the head coach, from the same team will result in a direct technical foul charge to the offender. If the offender is a member of bench personnel, the head coach is also charged with an indirect technical foul. Assistant coaches are not authorized to approach the scorer's table at any time. A team manager or statistician may obtain information from the scorer's table when the clock stops and the ball is dead. The head coach is permitted to go to the scorer's table to request a 60-second timeout to confer with personnel regarding a correctable error or to prevent or rectify a timing or scoring mistake error or an alternating possession mistake. Throw-ins Coaches, players, and officials will need to become well-versed in the new rules regarding throw-in locations. Accurately identifying the proper throw-in spots is imperative to ensure the proper balance of play between the offensive and defensive teams. By misapplying this rule, teams could gain an unfair advantage or be put at a disadvantage not intended by the rules. Coaches design specific plays and employ strategies based on where the ball is put in play. It is essential for game officials to be diligent in administering the ball at the proper throw-in location. When a stoppage occurs that will result in a throw-in, officials will need to know where did the foul or violation occur, is the throw-in team in their front court or back court, and where was the ball when the stoppage occurred. Understanding the answers to these questions will help officials know where to administer the throw-in spot as outlined by the rules change. Officials should use proper sight of foul, site of violation, and timeout procedures to communicate throw-in spots to players, coaches, as well as the other officials on the crew. After an official stops play for a foul, violation, timeout or other stoppage, they should indicate the spot of the ensuing throw-in. During timeouts, an official shall be located at the throw-in spot with the ball. If the throw-in spot is on the table side, the official will be located parallel with their partners directly across the court from the throw-in spot. The administering official should also employ proper ball placement procedures to indicate the direction of the next possession following the timeout. When the throw-in is along the inline, the ball shall be placed in front of the torso when the throw-in team's basket is at the opposite end of the court. When the ball is placed behind the official, the throw-in team's basket is on the same end of the court. When the throw-in is along the sideline, 
the ball shall be placed at the side of the torso that is closest to the basket of the team being awarded the ball. These procedures are put in place to aid in communicating to each team how play is expected to resume following the timeout. Finally, the administering official shall use the proper signal while verbalizing the type of throw-in to inform both teams. The official should verbally state either designated spot or you may move along the end line before placing the ball at the disposal of the thrower. End of game protocol. When the clock is stopped and the ball is dead, with limited playing time remaining, communication between partners and table personnel is imperative. Officials should use timeouts near the end of any quarter period to discuss scoring, timing, timeouts, and bonus situations. End of game contact. Proper coverage for any last second tries for goal. Overtime procedures, if needed, and approving the final score. Officials should communicate with the scorer and verify the score is correct, verify the number of timeouts remaining, and confirm the bonus situation for each team. After putting the ball in play, officials should ensure the clock was properly started. After each whistle, officials should check to see that the clock was properly stopped. If the timer makes a mistake and does not start or stop the clock correctly, the referee can only correct the mistake if they have definite knowledge of the time involved. If the official has definite knowledge of the exact time, then the referee must put that amount of time on the clock. In contact situations, officials need to make rulings based on the actions of the player who committed the foul. If a team fouls properly, making a legitimate attempt to play the ball or the player, a common foul should be ruled. The strategy of deliberately fouling to stop the clock at the end of the game is acceptable. If the offending team does not make a legitimate effort to play the ball or ball handler, an intentional foul should be ruled. Grabbing or pushing a dribbler from behind with no effort to play the ball are examples of actions that should be ruled intentional. Late in the game, it is suggested that the official responsible for the last second try indicate responsibility by placing a hand on their chest. In a crew of two, the trail official is primarily responsible for the last second try. In a crew of three, the official opposite the scorer's table, trail or center, is responsible for the last second try. It should be noted, officials should only sound the whistle to signify the end of the quarter period to indicate that a try was not released prior to the signal to end the period. It is also imperative that the primary official on a last second try signal a three-point attempt but not give a successful three-point signal unless they are also responsible for the last second try. In these situations, the officials will need to make eye contact and communicate before signaling to count or cancel the goal. If an overtime period is needed, the referee shall inform the head coaches, scorer, and timer of the overtime procedure. The procedure will include a four-minute period starting with a jump ball, a new AP arrow setting. Each team receives one additional 60-second timeout. Unused timeouts carry over to the overtime period. Team baskets remain the same as the fourth quarter and the team foul counts do not reset to zero. At the conclusion of the game, the referee must make eye contact with the scorer to confirm no problems are evident and approve the final score prior to leaving the visual confines of the playing area. When the score is confirmed, the crew shall leave the playing area together. We wish to thank you for watching this video and we hope this information IBO has provided will help you to have a successful 
2023-2024 basketball season. If you have any questions about IBO, please contact the IBO office at area 717-713-8129 or visit the IBO website at www.ibo.org.